This just-in-time show is going to focus on the glide path and how to manage difficult, curved, and aberrant canals. As we can see from this spinning animation, there's a lot of complex anatomy that's dominantly in the apical one-third. So, great access is essential, and clinically, when we look in the mouth mirror, without moving the mirror, we should see all the orifices. This pulp chamber then can be filled up with a viscous chelator such as Glide, RC Prep, or Prolube. The advantages of a viscous chelator are it gives us a superior lubricant so we can slide around sheaths of fibrotic tissue and denticles that might exist within the canal. Also, we know that we can generate debris, and the debris that we're generating can keep the tissue and the debris more effectively held in suspension. And finally, in vital cases that bleed, viscous chelators prevent the readherence of tissue and pave the way for the introduction of the next file. I'm using these instruments with little back and forth reciprocating strokes. Each little back and forth stroke draws the instrument a little bit deeper into the canal. When the handle is just snug, pull. You'll shear dentin and you'll be cutting on the out stroke. Most dentists were trained endodontically to aggressively cut into canals. In this method of canal preparation, we're cutting always on the out stroke, away from the terminus, and to the greater cross-sectional diameters. Once we've negotiated a few millimeters of the canal, little back and forth motions tend to smooth and refine that area of the canal and allow us to reciprocate the handle to pull the file a little deeper down the canal. When we're about three rubber stops short, we know we have a pretty decent glide path if we can move this instrument in and out reproducibly over the coronal two-thirds. Push the stop down. This will give us the maximum depth of penetration where the canal has been secured, and that working length can be transferred to your first rotary or reciprocating file. This instrument then can shape that region of the canal, and that instrument will never go into no man's land. In other words, will always stay inside the secured region. Now, in the presence of a viscous chelator, we can take a small size file, typically for me it's a 10, and using little back and forth reciprocation motions, the file's drawn down. Every time the handle is snug, pull. Feed it in a little bit deeper, pull. Each feed it in pull represents one cutting cycle. I'm typically using about six cutting cycles with the 10 and another six cutting cycles with the 15 and that will produce enough space to accommodate the first rotary mechanical instrument. Oftentimes, when you get deeper in the canal, the instrument just doesn't want to advance. Rather than attack, let's pull out the instrument and let's pre-curve the file, placing the curve closer to its working tip. Notice how the pre-curve file can pass through the pre-enlarged canal passively. Notice how the tip of the file lightly bounces off the lateral walls and when it arrives in the curvature, it's remarkably pre-curved. Little short watch winding strokes draw the instrument around the curve and a little bit deeper in the canal. Repeated in out strokes smooth and refine so we can reciprocate the handle gently and advance a little deeper towards working length. When we get about one stop from our reference point short of the expected full working length, let's not reciprocate the file anymore, let's slide to length. Sliding to length prevents ripping and tearing the foramen. It's important to confirm patency. Move the file in and out minutely through and do this intentionally and repeatedly until the instrument is sloppy loose. Well, we now need to make a decision between manual versus mechanical finishing. This means we need to confirm the glide path. Since each third of the root is about three to five millimeters, let's pull the instrument back about one to two millimeters and slide back to length. Let's pull it back three or four millimeters and see if we can slip and slide back to length. And finally, let's withdraw the 15 file four, five, or six millimeters back. And if we can slide the instrument repeatedly to length anytime we say so, we not only have a glide path, we own the glide path and you can see in this mandibular molar, clinically, the instrument is very free and loose to travel 
over its apical extent. When we have a reconfirmed and reproducible glide path, it's easy for mechanical instruments to shape that region of the canal. I've always said whoever owns the glide path wins the rotary game of endodontics. And incidentally, as a side note, maybe I'll even add wins the mechanical game of endodontics. Stay tuned. Let's review glide path management. Probably the most important first thing to say is let's respect the anatomy and recognize oftentimes the most complex anatomy occurs in the apical one-third. Recall the importance of viscous chelators, especially when negotiating and securing canals. Let's sequence the preparation and do pre-enlargement first before we place instruments in the typically more difficult anatomy. The apical one-third can be negotiated with small-sized hand files. Once we have working length and a patent canal, we need to make a decision between manual versus mechanical shaping procedures. So, you can see in glide path management that it's going to be important to have a plan because in the more difficult cases, having a glide path over any aspect of the total length of a root canal, that area can be shaped and facilitate the progressive deeper placement of files until we get a final preparation that is shaped to be cleaned and is shaped to be filled.